So today we're going to be talking about what evidence we have for evolution. So there are five main evidences for evolution. Um, the first one is biogeography, which is basically how species are distributed. So um, if you have similar climates on different continents, theoretically those animals never came in contact with each other. But if they look similar or have similar features, that gives us some evidence that it was the climate itself that decided or picked those features, which is natural selection. Um, we have the fossil record, so we are able to look back into fossils that we collect um, and we can put them in order. So we can actually date them either by where we find them in the rock. Obviously, the higher the fossil is, the, the newer it is. Um, or we can do something called radio dating. And what we can do is take fossils of similar creatures that look like they would be the same species and put them in timeline order. And that shows us change over time. Um, we can compare anatomy of current existing animals, both homologous structures, which is, we're going to talk about homo meaning the same, and something called vestigial structures, those are leftover structures. Uh, we can look at the embryonic development, especially with similar organisms, for example, chordates or organisms with a backbone, we're going to look at that. And then molecular biology is the idea that basically DNA is the same for every living thing on this planet. So us, a snail, grass, basically every single person is made up of the same um, types of DNA, the same structure of DNA, the same nitrogenous bases. And that gives evidence that we all came from a common ancestor. So starting first with, on the top right corner, um, you see the geographic distribution. So don't forget that at some point all continents were connected. We call that Pangea. Um, and what we find is similar species, similar creatures among these continents. Um, <clears throat> so some, some of that is giving evidence that these continents, first of all, were connected. So these animals probably lived in areas that were connected. And it also gives, you know, idea where you're going to find these fossils in these common areas. It can also, again, like we said, show if you have similar environments with similar creatures, that's giving evidence that the creatures have evolved to fit the environment. Um, in the bottom left-hand corner, you will see four homologous structures. Homologous, you know, homo meaning the same. These are going to have the same structure, even though they have different functions. So if you look at the limbs of four species here, we have a human, a cat, a whale, and a bat. Um, obviously, those limbs are used for very different things. A bat is going to fly, a whale is going to swim. Humans and cats walk, but they walk differently. Um, but you can see they all have similar structure in those bones. So the top bone um, is going to have that same kind of ball and socket joint, um, single bone at the top. Then you have two double kind of wrists or forearm bones. <clears throat> and then you have kind of the middle hand bones and then the digit bones. So that's showing that they have similar structure, even though they have developed different functions as time has gone on. And again, that's leading to the idea that all vertebrates, which is animals with the backbone, probably had a common ancestor in the past. Um, on the right here, you see the evolution of a horse. So we have collected bones of horses um, throughout time. We've dated them, and if you put them in order, you can kind of see how the horse has evolved over time. You see it got a little bit taller. Um, the limbs kind of changed. It got a little bit, you know, stockier slash thinner in some places. And again, that's putting fossils in order. So this is showing an example of the similar embryonic development. Um, if you look at the bottom of this picture, you can see all the different organisms. Um, what they have in common is they're all what we call vertebrates, meaning they have a, a backbone. Um, so they have that in similarity. If you look at the very top row compared to the very bottom row, um, the top row is very early in embryonic development, like a couple weeks old. You can see they all look very, very, very similar. It's even hard to kind of pick out the human in that scenario. Um, as they get older and they progress, of course, they change and they turn into the animal that they are. Um, but the idea that they have that very early embryonic development in common, that they look similar very early on, again, gives some evidence that they all come from a common ancestor, which probably is the common ancestor to all backboned animals. The Hardy-Weinberg theorem um, is looking at basically answering the question whether or not a species is evolving. So one of the biggest questions is, are humans evolving? It's a difficult question for us to answer because remember it takes 50 generations for something to evolve. So it's kind of hard for humans being that our lifespan so long to kind of figure that out. It's easier to look past and figure out if something has evolved more than are they evolving now. Um, but the Hardy-Weinberg theorem tries to kind of give evidence to that, kind of give more scientific or definitive answers of yes or no, something's evolving. 
Um, what it does is it looks at frequencies of alleles and genotypes in the population, and it kind of compares what they were versus what they are now. And if those allele frequencies change, if the dominant recessive genes change, especially drastically, you can kind of say um, for sure that a, a, an organism is devolving, evolving. Um, we say that an organism or a species is at equilibrium when the alleles and genotypes remain constant, especially throughout multiple generations, meaning you're going to have the same distribution of, you know, hair color, eye color, height. That means that the species is relatively staying the same. So we say that they are at evolutionarily or evolutionary equilibrium. So you can figure out this Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium mathematically. Um, basically what you're going to do is you're going to say that allele A or the dominant allele in a population is going to be um, kind of um, portrayed with the letter P and the allele little a or the recessive allele is going to be the uh, letter Q and what you're going to do is you're going to say that in any species P plus Q should equal one. Um, if you think about a frequency it's very similar to a percent, a frequency is kind of a percent before you multiply by 100, and we know that all percents should equal 100, that's where we get that one from. So if you know a P frequency or a Q frequency, you can find the opposite just by subtracting from one. We are gonna practice um, these on a worksheet, so don't panic, we're gonna go over these a little bit more. This equation that you're looking at here, the difference is, is it the genotype or the phenotype? So is it what it looks like? Or is it the letter? So that's where we get the dominant recessive carrier idea. So kind of the same thing with the P. The P is for the dominant letter. The Q is the recessive letter. The difference here, though, is P squared is two dominants. Um, Q squared is two recessives. And then the PQ is where you have that mix, that dominant and recessive. And again, notice they're going to equal one. And again, we're going to practice this, so don't panic. This is just your introduction to this equation. So you can see here an example. Um, where you're giving P's and Q's and you're kind of figuring out what those allele frequencies are, what the distribution is. Um, this is just showing you kind of a sample problem. And again, we will practice this in a worksheet. So in order for Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium to occur, meaning that a population is stable, a population is not evolving, he came up with five characteristics or five requirements of that. Um, one, he said there has to be an extremely large population with very little genetic drift. Two, there must be no gene flow. Um, the, the species has to be isolated from other populations. There must be no mutations. And that's the hardest one because there's always mutations. Every division of a cell pretty much leads to a mutation. So sometimes we enter the word no meaningful mutations or no lasting mutations. So if you have a mutation that just gets eliminated within one generation, that doesn't really count. We're talking about these lasting mutation gen uh, among generations. There must be no random mating and no sexual selection. So there is no traits being selected for by the mate. And then of course, no natural selection, no um, nature choosing the best trait. If any of these conditions are not met, so one of these things is true, we say that microevolution is occurring and the species is not at equilibrium. Um, and one could argue, you know, that could be everything. Again, it kind of depends on your perspective. And then, of course, microevolutions are going to lead to macroevolutions over time. So this is how you tell or how you categorize whether or not a species is evolving. One of the things that keeps evolution going um, is genetic variation. So remember, you need to have variation within a species in order to have one gene that's better or more fit for an environment than the other. And one way that we keep that going is through diploidy. So it's the idea that in sexual selection, you inherit two alleles, one from mom, one from dad. And that kind of gives just some genetic variation in the fact that there's all different combinations. So it's the idea if you do, you know, you have 30 genes, two options for each gene, what are the, the combinations? And it's, it's a lot. We're in like the millions or the billions. Um, the other idea is the heterozygote advantage. So sometimes when you have a heterozygote, which means you have one allele that, that are different, so you have one dominant allele and one recessive allele, that results in a characteristic that doesn't exist in either of the dominant or recessive populations. So an example of that is people who have sickle cell anemia actually end up being resistant to malaria, and that is an evolutionary advantage because they're not dying of malaria. So again, these are all kind of the gene... Um, things that can happen, the random gene things that could happen that help evolution and help our, our um, genetic variation to continue. So we talk about the tempo of evolution, which is how fast or slow it's occurring or, or how or what rate it's occurring. Um, Darwin believed in what we call gradualism, which is slow, constant change. So if you look at the graph, you kind of have one species leading to another, leading to another. And you notice that graph's very 
um, standard and it's kind of rising at an equal rate. We don't think this is what happens. Um, current science are thinking that we have something called punctuated equilibrium, where it's more of a stair step. So you have long periods of minor to no change interrupted by very significant changes that happen very quickly. Um, this makes more sense in terms of how quickly the environment changes. So basically, you have a system or a, a, a time where everything's kind of not evolving, everything's in equilibrium, and then you get rapid change in response to a rapid environmental change. If you don't change in that time, then you go extinct, and that's how we get very quickly extinct animals. Um, so we think, you know, even though Darwin believed in this gradualism, we think the more likely scenario is this punctuated equilibrium. So convergent evolution actually also gives us evidence for evolution. This is where two species independently come up with the same kind of design um, to fit the environment they're living. So it's kind of opposite of homologous structures. Um, it's where it's a different structure but the same function. Um, we call these analogous, again, for opposite. So the example here would be wings. Um, wings are used for flying. Um, so when you develop wings, you're generally flying around. If you look at a bat, an eagle, and a pterosaur, which is a, you know, a dinosaur, um, their wings are very different in terms of their structure, but the function's the same. The same with a bee's wings or a bird's wings. Those are called analogous structures. So that is different structure, same function. And again, this leads or gives credence to the idea that things evolve over time, which means they're changing depending on the environment they're living in. Other types of evolution we see here are divergent, convergent, and parallel. So divergent is kind of exactly what it sounds like. You diverge in woods where you have a common species, a common ancestor that then splits into two new species. Um, a convergent evolution is where you have species that were very different, kind of non-contact in the beginning that then kind of um, <clears throat> evolved to be very similar to each other. And then parallel evolution are two species that evolve along their own lines, but never really come in contact, never really evolve similarly to each other. You can see that it kind of looks like parallel lines. So one of the ways that we track these changes or try to map out how things have evolved um, is something called phylogeny. So this is going to show evolutionary relationships among organisms. Um, you've seen this as like a, a family tree, for example, as an example of phylogeny. Phylog phylogeny is also called um, a phylogenetic tree or a branching tree. So you can see the example there. Um, it's going to show relationships among different species over a time. Um, it's going to show kind of how long things take to go from one to the other. Um, you can see the closer the branches are or the length of the branches or the number of changes, that's telling you how, you know, how many changes have occurred or how long that species has been evolving over time. So the one confusing thing about a phylogenetic tree is you're used to seeing the tree branching diagram, but it can also look at the picture on the left. It's still a branching. It's kind of just like the one on the left is looking at a more specific branch. So it's kind of like a sub branch of the whole tree. So either of these are considered phylogenetic trees. Um, and you can answer questions about how related species are. So the first question says, which are more closely related, a whale and a hippo or a whale and a pig? So the way that you would answer that is you'd look at the whale's location and you look at the hippo and then compare that to the whale and the pig. And what you're going to look at is what we call nodes or branches or where the branches kind of happen. So you can see a whale and a hippo are connected kind of with this bracket here. So their node of attachments there versus a whale and a pig, you see the path to get to each other is much longer. You have to go from this node to this one to this one to this. So the closer the animals are on the tree, the closer they are to a node, the more likely related they are. So a whale is actually way more related to a hippo than it is to a pig. Um, you say, which animal is the least related? Um, you're, what you're going to look at is kind of what we call the outgroup or the, the kind of furthest branch away. So the outgroup will be here or it will be the camel. You see the camel, it has the kind of the first separation. That means it's the least related. Now, cladistics are going to show relationships based on traits or characteristics only. One of the key things is there's no time in a cladogram or cladistic. So they do not tell you anything about time or how far apart things are. It's just what traits are common. So looking at the left here, that is a cladogram. Um, they're going to separate species kind of similarly where the closer they are on the line, the closer the related they are. But notice that these cladograms are going to have characteristics here. So you see jaws, lungs, dry skin. And what happens is where this characteristic is, everything after it does not have that, or sorry, has that thing. So a lamprey does not have jaws, but everybody else does. Um, a shark does not have lungs, but everybody else does. And again, the more traits they have in common, the more closely related they are. 
So cladograms are created, um, if you look at the table like this one, where you're going to look at common characteristics among organisms. Um, they're not always in order, however. So sometimes on the AP test, they'll give you these very similar to this with zeros and ones. They just might not be in order. A zero indicates the animal does not have that trait. A one indicates it does. So because this was in order, you see the nice kind of decrease in similarities where the top lamprey has basically nothing in common. Um, and the human has everything in common, has all those traits. Um, so you would use this diagram, this table, to make the cladogram down below. You can see the similarity. So, for example, you know, the first, the red, um, is the jaws. So a lamprey does not have jaws. And then you see the trait, and then everything after that has jaws. Again, that's going to show you not only the traits that are in common, but also how, you know, related organisms are. So you see the human and gorilla are closer together on the cladogram, which means they're more closely related. Um, as opposed to, for example, a lizard and a shark, farther apart, they're probably less related. So if we do a little practice here, again, you'll do more in a worksheet later, but um, the question here says, what trait separates the lamprey from the rest of the species? Um, so you see here, you would find the lamprey is kind of the first offshoot, um, and then here's the rest of the species. So it's saying, you know, what trait is going to separate? Um, and you're going to see there that it's going to be the vertebrate ancestor. So the vertebrate would be the backbone. And the second question there says, which are more closely related, a bear and a newt, or a lizard and a lamprey? So to tell relation and how close they are, you see how close they are together on the, the cladogram. So the first is a bear here and a newt. So they kind of have a two separation. And a lizard here and a lamprey. Here we have one, two, three separations. So because a bear and a newt are closer together on the cladogram, you're going to say that they are more closely related. The last kind of evidence we use for evolution or the last thing we use to explain evolution is the idea of comparing structures. So again, the more structures animals have in common, the more likely they are to be related. There's kind of two ways we do this. One is called homology and one is called analogy. Homology meaning the same and analogy like anti meaning different. So homology or common traits result from adaptive radiation, common ancestors or similar origin. This is usually animals who have the same um, feature with a different function. An analogy is going to result from convergent evolution, different ancestors or different origin. Um, basically, they have started off different and they've actually come together later on. This is where the form of the trait or the um, body part is going to look different, but it's going to have a similar function. So this slide here is giving you examples of analogous and homologous structures. That's homo homology and analogy. Um, so if you look at the analogous structures, we have a shark, a penguin, and a dolphin. Um, these animals are not closely related. They don't really have a common ancestor that's recent. Probably one a long time ago, but not a more recent one. But you see their body shapes and their fins or flippers um, are very similar in shape. Um, they have a similar function that they evolve separately because of the environment that they live in. So that's kind of what gives us evidence for evolution. They're all living in water. They all need to swim very quickly. So they kind of develop the same kind of appendage. Whereas homology, homologous structures here, you see a human arm, a cat arm, a whale fin, and a bat wing. Um, these probably did come from a common ancestor at some point. And what you see is even though these structures are used for very different purposes because they live in different environments, um, they have a similar bone structure. So you see they all have kind of a top bone that goes into a shoulder joint. They have two four bones or four limbs. They have kind of a wrist palm type bones here, the kind of orangey ones. And then they have those brownish uh, digit or finger like bones. So again, these do not have the same function. Obviously a whale's fin is very different from a human arm, but because they have those similar bone structures, that gives evidence that they had some kind of common ancestor a long time ago.